Hey there, Adrian Rosebrock here from PyImageSearch.com, and today we're going to be discussing what deep learning is. This is the first tutorial in our series on the introduction to neural networks and deep learning, and over the course of these series of guides, you're going to start learning about what deep learning is, the history of deep learning, neural networks, and how we've come here today with the latest reincarnation of neural networks. So to start, deep learning and artificial intelligence, what's the relationship between the two? Well, Machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. So there are these classical machine learning algorithms that you'll typically encounter and you may have likely already heard of, like support vector machines and random forest classifiers and logistic regression. Well, there's this other type of class of machine learning algorithm called neural networks. And inside of the neural networks field, you also have these deep neural networks. And the, one of the reasons deep learning has become so popular is because even with your traditional computer vision algorithms, your traditional machine learning algorithms, it's really hard for a computer to understand what is in an image. So we look at this image here on the slide, and as a person, you can look at it and be like, well, that's clearly a dog. But as a computer, eh, not so much. All a computer sees is a big matrix of numbers. It doesn't really understand what is inside that image. It doesn't understand what we call the, the semantic gap, the difference between what we as a person know and intuitively understand and what a computer sees or understands. That space between bridging that gap is called the semantic gap. And that's what all of artificial intelligence within computer vision is trying to solve. It's trying to bridge that semantic gap so we can have a deeper understanding of what is in an image. Originally, when our research on neural networks first started, we had single layer networks. And this here on the slide is an example of a perceptron algorithm. We have a number of inputs to a neural network. Those could be you know, pixel intensities of an image. It could be features extracted from an image like a color histogram, it could be local binary patterns. It could, it's entirely arbitrary, whatever you select the input to the neural network. Then we have these weights, and these are the weights that are learned and tuned by the network during the training process. So what we see here is we're just taking these inputs with the weights, taking the dot product, having this weighted sum, and then applying a step function, which is similar to like a synapse in an actual cellular structure. So this was a very simple formulation of neural networks, but the problem was it was found that we couldn't solve nonlinear problems. So researchers continued within um, continue studying neural networks, and we started to create multi-layer networks. And we call these multi-layer networks because there's one or more hidden layers inside the network. And again, these weights, these layers have nodes that can be tuned via algorithms such as backpropagation. And in fact, you know, backpropagation is arguably the most important algorithm that has made neural network research uh, possible. You know, we have algorithms like your optimizers, like st uh, stochastic gradient descent, vanilla gradient descent, and then, you know, newer optimizers such as uh, Atom, Adagrad, and, and RMS prop. But really, backpropagation is what has allowed us to train deeper neural networks with one or more hidden layers, and it's also what's allowed us to solve non-linearly separable problems. So again, multi-layer networks, they're trained via backpropagation. They can solve non-linearly separable problems, which we'll discuss in a second, but I want to caveat that by saying when the right activation function is used. So you know, traditional neural networks, specifically with your perceptrons, we, we would use a step function. It's not differentiable creates a bit of a problem when we apply backpropagation. We've also used hypertangent. We've used uh, like a sigmoid activation function. But really, it wasn't until the ReLU activation function that we were really able to start training these deeper and deeper neural networks. So let's talk a second about the concept of a non-linearly separable problem. And this is an example of the exclusive OR data set, and, or XOR for short, meaning that we're, we're taking a page from uh, bitwise operations. So here we have two classes. One is a red star and the other is these, these blue stars. And our goal is, can we draw a single line in this 2D plane that separates these two classes? Well, as it turns out, no, you can't. There's no way that we could take this line and draw it such that we can separate both of those classes. And if you need to pause this video to convince yourself that's true, you know, by all means, go ahead and take a second if you need to, but convince yourself that no matter how hard you try, there is not a line that you can draw that can separate those classes. And that's what we mean by non-linearly separable. So the problem here is that nearly all real world problems are non-linearly separable. 
ImageNet classification, Cipher 10, you know, training your own neural network on your custom data set to you know, recognize license plates or bacon models of vehicles or face recognition, any, nearly any, any real world data set you encounter, it's going to be non-linearly separable. But your standard formation of neural networks with just a single hidden layer like a perceptron, they can't separate these types of problems. And furthermore, if we don't formulate our multi-layer ne neural networks properly, we're still not going to be able to separate these non-linearly separable data sets. So a neural network with two or more hidden layers can learn functions that can separate these non-linear data sets provided that we initialize the weights in our neural, neural network in an intelligent manner. And we also use a good activation function such as ReLU. But before we go any further, let's kind of compare and contrast traditional machine learning versus our current deep learning. So with traditional machine learning, we have a pipeline here on the left. And what we have is this concept of feature extraction where we want to quantify the input image in some way. Maybe we want to quantify color. So we could use the mean and standard deviation of the red, green, and blue color channels. We could compute color histograms and various color spaces. Maybe we're interested in say, shape, so you have like who moments and Zernike moments. And if you want to do texture, you have local binary patterns, you have Harlick features. So you choose one or more of these feature extractors and you have a data set of input images. So these input images go into your, you know, black box feature extractor and out comes these sets of features for each input image. And then you train a machine learning classifier and it's a, it's a traditional machine learning classifier like an SVM or a random forest. And then that, that model is able to make your output predictions. Deep learning models, on the other hand, they're operating on the raw pixel intensities of an input image. And furthermore, they're learning a hierarchy of features. Traditional machine learning methods and computer vision methods, they don't normally operate on the raw pixel intensities themselves. That's because they can be noisy and there's just too much data and it's not in a structured manner. So that's why we have all these handcrafted feature algorithms like color histograms and local binary patterns. Deep learning, since Deep learning actually operates on the raw pixel intensities of the input image, which is fundamentally different than feature extraction algorithms. And furthermore, these neural networks are learning a hierarchy. So we take an input image and then the lower level layers of the network that are closest to the input image, that's when we're learning these like simple features like edges and color blobs. And then your middle layer networks as you go, go deeper, maybe these edges and these color blobs can be connected together and you form corners of objects. And finally, towards the bottom layer of the network, this is where your more abstract features are being learned, like parts of animals or parts of objects altogether, such as you know the ears of a cat or the, the hubcaps of a car. And finally, at the bottom, you have this classification or regression layer. That's where you're making your output final predictions. So when you compare and contrast machine learning, traditional machine learning versus deep learning, keep in mind that at least in the context of computer vision, traditional methods really rely on a handcrafted algorithmic approach to quantifying an input image. While neural networks and deep learning, on the other hand, they're really operating on the raw pixel intensities of the image themselves. And they're also learning a hierarchy. So the deeper and deeper and deeper you go into the network, the more rich, the more abstract features you're learning. So let's talk about the history. In the 1990s and before, our label data sets were just too small. Our computers were too slow. We initialized our weights in just a inferior, poor way, and we used the wrong type of nonlinear activation function. All of that kind of compounded towards the 70s and 80s to just more or less kill off neural network research. Researchers at the time were not too keen on neural networks. They weren't bullish. They were thinking, man, this isn't the right research avenue to go down. We're not going to be able to solve complex problems with neural networks. And that's primarily due to the fact that our data sets were just too small and our computers were too slow to train deep neural networks to learn these hierarchy of features. So for that reason, that's why many researchers focused uh, on SVMs and random forests. At the time, those were believed to learn more features, to learn richer features, more discriminative features, and that's where more accuracy was going to come from. But neural network research didn't entirely die out. It continued and it continued and it, there was a smaller community, but over time it started to grow. And then finally, you know, once we had the ImageNet competition and we started to see the, the AlexNet 
model, which is really what exploded the current iteration of neural networks that we have, we realized we were finally at the point now where we have faster computers, we have highly optimized hardware such as GPUs, we have large labeled data sets in the orders of millions of images, we have a far, far better understanding of how to initialize the weights in our neural network in an intelligent manner and our activation functions are better. So all of this has compounded together at the right time to create this latest resurgence in neural networks that we call deep learning. But the real power of deep learning is that we've shown that with the more data you have available, the higher your performance is, the better your accuracy is. And that's not the case with traditional feature extraction and machine learning algorithms. We would hit this plateau and then the slope of our accuracy or the slope of our performance would slow down and essentially stagnate. But when we found that when we took these deep neural networks and trained them on larger data sets and continued to add to those data sets, our performance not only eclipsed the traditional feature extraction and machine learning approach, but it also had a faster slope to it. We could grow faster. We could obtain higher accuracy. So that's another one of the reasons why deep learning is so popular today. But that raises the question, you know, how deep is deep and what makes a particular neural network a deep neural network versus just a standard neural network. Well, there's no real consensus in the research community on, on what is deep versus not. And this is especially true since, since AlexNet and then from there VGGNet and then ResNet and an efficient net. You know, we have networks that are extremely deep. So what I say is that if you're using a specialized network architecture that fits in with the current research trend that we've seen in this latest resurgence of neural networks, and that includes network architectures such as CNN or recurrent neural networks or long short-term memory networks and the like. Well, if you're using a specialized network architecture, in that case, I would call that deep learning. But then we start discussing what does the depth of a network have to be to be considered deep? Because as we've shown and as we've learned, a network with greater than depth of two, previously that was just computationally impossible to train. And we didn't have enough data to train networks that, that deep as well. But with the latest advent of, of deep learning, we have larger data sets, faster computers, so we can train networks that have a depth of greater than two, meaning more than two hidden layers. Previously that was impossible. So technically if your network has more than two hidden layers, according to the previous definition of neural networks, well, in that case, it is a deep neural network. But what if your network has 10 layers or 100 layers or 1,000 layers? Because we've trained ResNet variations that have thousands of layers. We've trained efficient net uh, variations that have hundreds and thousands of layers. My point is that the definition of what deep is changes every single week inside this research community. We've, we've looked at creating deeper networks. We've looked at creating wider networks. We've looked at creating wider and deeper networks. So instead of worrying about how deep deep actually is, instead define it based off the types of layers and the network architectures you're being utilized. That is, in my opinion, the best way to consider what is deep learning versus what is standard neural networks. So don't get too caught up in the buzzwords. Just learn about the network architectures themselves, and then from there you can consider it deep learning. So I hope this tutorial was helpful. Make sure you read the text version of this guide as well to gain some deeper understanding, and I'll see you later.